going on with the webinar, uh, let's move on here. Um, so the webinar is, is having a starting point in uh, the development and the vision for a Center for Healthcare Architecture uh, for development and change and uh, related to the built environment for healthcare. Uh, the infrastructure we all need for the healthcare systems in our various parts of the world. And we are active in the research and development and continuous interact with the uh, industry around us. There's an N missing in continuously. We'll fix that for the final presentation. Um, and uh, so the topic here of today follows these, this vision here, to be a center for exchange of experiences and knowledge and research on the built environment for healthcare. Um, for those of you who are attending today that do not know anything about CVA, uh, we were established in 20, 2006 and um, we are a small group of around four or five people working here uh, together with a couple of people in projects, altogether 10, 12 people. And we work a lot with all the other networks in Sweden are well connected with uh, the regions uh, that are responsible for delivering healthcare in Sweden, uh, various associations, including the Swedish National Board of Housing, Building and Planning, with whom we collaborate with. Uh, so we try to be in position to share knowledge and contribute to uh, sharing of experiences. One of the way we do that is in the form of webinars. And today's webinar is having a look outside Sweden and therefore, of course, it's also in English. And the program today, it's where the times are approximate, but it's an idea of where we're going. Uh, this is a welcome uh, and you are all very welcome, all the people that have joined and of course, especially all our panelists here around us. Um, we have a number of presenters, I'll run through them in a second. You can see them here. We start with presentation in just shortly and run up to around a little bit after 10 past two, where we have a break. And then we continue all together with a discussion here on the panelists. Uh, we then wrap up and uh, have a final comment before we end at three o'clock. And I'm hoping that everybody will be active in the discussions further down. So who are all these people? Well, uh, here is a list of names. There's a lot of people who have long affiliations these days, but we got Grant Mills uh, from uh, UCL in London. We got David Allison from Clemson in the US, and he's also have here with his colleague, Angeli Joseph, also from Clemson, uh, slightly different roles. We also have Stefano Capolongo from um, Politecnico di Milano, and he's also got a colleague, uh, Andrea Bramilla, with him. Uh, Andrea Mern comes from Germany, but is working in the Netherlands with healthcare issues there, and we'll present that perspective. And I think farthest away today is Marcio de Oliveira from Brazil, who share his perspective. And um, first, I must say uh, a warm welcome to, to uh, Angeli and David, who got up earliest this morning. For some of us, it's eight in the afternoon. And then I think, Marcio, you're still in the morning too, but not as early as David and Angeli. Uh, so Zoom hasn't fixed the, the timing issues yet. A lot of other things we can do with Zoom. So again, a warm welcome to you all. And let's go back then to the program. Um, we are now going to have these presentations and uh, we're pretty much on time. I mean, these exact times will not be perfect, but it's an idea of where we're going. So I will hereby ask uh, Andrea Moen to share with us your thoughts and ideas on where is healthcare design in your context going. So over to you, Andrea. Thank you very much, Joran. If you stop sharing, I can share my screen. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon from me in the Netherlands. <laughs> Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be giving this lecture in front of you today. And I would especially like to thank Professor Joran Lindahl for the invitation. I'm Andrea Moen, principal and owner of Andrea Moen Architects in Rotterdam and member of the organizational committee of the ARC22 Health and Care Conference on behalf of which I will speak to you today about new perspectives in the Netherlands for people with care demand. ARC22 will, with the title Enabling Healthcare and Wellbeing, will take place in 2022, 
the next year, from 22nd of August until the 24th. We recently organized a webinar ahead of the conference. Two masterclasses and the best practice lectures showed trends, new perspectives and approaches in relation to the design of environment for people in need of care in the Netherlands, which I would like to share with you today. Four aspects were repeated in all the examples shown in the webinar. I will point out each aspect by using one of the, sh one of the shown examples of the webinar. The first aspect is participation and the importance of an active role for everyone involved. One of the masterclasses was held by Habion, which is not only a housing corporation for elderly. In recent years, Habion was partly transformed, uh, has partly transformed its traditional care homes and realized new construction. This is always an opportunity to reinvent housing for the elderly, a new form of living that has value for the resident and the neighborhood, and that is ready for the future. The transformation process begins with redesign, re resident meetings organized by Habion's transformation team. How do you want to, everyone is heard, how do you want to grow old? What do you need for this? And what do you bring in other questions? Um, with these questions, the new program for the location in question is examined and elaborated. During the workshop, we introduced the participants to this transformation accompanying process supported by Harbion's transformation team. The workshop participants had their say and thus became the seniors of the future. This graphic shows the wishes of the seniors, the connection with the neighborhood, your home and the encounter with others are the most important aspects for a life full of quality. These results are similar for the participants in the masterclass. Surprisingly, it seems that receiving care doesn't seem to be as important to participants as we would expect. The next key aspect I'd like to show you is the effect of a personalized environment. In the second masterclass, the participants were given the opportunity to improve the, the physical environment of a mentally disabled client with behavioral problems by designing a personalized environment. Years ago, our office, Andrea Moen Architects, had created Dolph's Room, a tailor-made environment for mentally disabled clients with extreme behavioral problems that had a very positive effect on the client's behavior and helped him to re-socialize. Here, here you see an overview of our approach, which is mostly based on careful observations of the clients and interviews, as well as close cooperation with the nursing staff and psychiatrists of the health organization. The main key is biographical work, looking back to the time when their lives had the real age of their mental capacity, mostly when they were two or three or four years old, sometimes even babies, picking the moment when their lives still felt good and harmonious. Their mostly extreme behavior is an expression of missing this time and often the only way they can express themselves that they no longer, that they long for it back. In Dolph's case, it, uh, could see, I could see him playing the role of a farmer. This observation seemed correct. Later we found out that he grew up, that he had grown up in a typical Dutch landscape. Sorry. In 2020, Ipse de Bruggen uh, launched this initiative, physical environment, a fixed value to our, in our care, the impetus of this, for this was the positive effect on Dolph's behavior after the tailor-made redesign of his room. 12 rooms will be transformed within four years and the effects on the clients will be scientifically in investigated. During the workshop, participants have been actively involved in the steps of such a transformation process using a case study. They saw a film about Annika and were asked to observe her behavior and need, needs closely. Then they were asked what what would be the perfect perfect environment for Annika and is a healthy environment something that you could uh, would include in your care. Here are some results of the mood boards they produced. Following the, master, the two master classes, Millie Herweyer from the Wiegerink Architects and Femke Veenstra from Gottemarker Alga Veenstra Architects gave an inspiring best practice lecture on six projects. In the next three projects, um, by Rottemarker Alga Fenster Architects, I will focus on the subject of self-determination. 93 residents of a nursing home all have their own front door facing the public space in this project. This gives them a feeling of self-determination. 
by working with the location determination and residents via home automation, they always know whether people are safe. 10 different themed common rooms are positioned in the center. The residents can choose between different atmospheres and themed rooms like a kitchen, dining room, a garden, sports or music room. There is a library as well as a working place and lounge areas that remind residents of the beach or a meadow. It, is possible to it isn't possible to show all these wonderful projects in detail, but I want to focus on one or two particular details with each project that plays an important role, so social role, in the plan. Here, the balconies on this social residents can choose whether they want to connect them to a share, share table in the middle or prefer a visual separation. The, the perforated balcony railing allows views and growth opportunities for flowers, as you can see. In this research by design project, Art Science of Dementia Care, the role senses play for people with dementia has been observed. A sensory path through the corridors of a nursing home had been, has been designed for the re-experiences of the patients. Different test frequencies and objects, as well as different locations and furniture with different shapes were used as test locations. It seemed that familiar shapes and colors attracted the most attention. The last three projects I show, show how important it is for all of us to be part of the community. From a large institute with large scope to a safe mixed close living environment in the neighborhood, from a traditional housing to a layered living, this is the concept for a healthy living where care, healthy houses, landscape and social spaces fit together in a layered living community. What makes, a home, what makes a house a home? Can the built environment in this chapter of their lives meet the residents' need of sustainable living environment, give them a sense of ownership and control? This example shows how important a, a home in the form of a personally designed apartment is for each resident, as well as common spaces in which one can meet and, and stuff works. The integration of this nursing home into the normal in living environment leads to many interaction and social contacts between the residents and their neighbors, as can be seen in the photo. Being part of the community is what we all need and what increases our quality of life into old age. Before I, before I end my lecture, I would like to draw your attention to ARC 22, the fifth Architectural Research Care and Health Conference with the title Enabling Healthcare and Wellbeing that will be take place uh, from 22nd to 24th of August next year at the Technical University in Delft and the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. We have received more than 100 abstracts from over 14 countries on the three topics integration of needs, healthcare design and change, and engagement. For further information, I refer you to the website of the conference shown above. Please follow, follow us also on LinkedIn and we are looking forward to meeting you next August, next year in August. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, and I'll just pop in my screen here in between. Um, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I just like to tell all the participants that if you write your questions in chat, uh, we will note them and bring them up later in the discussion. Um, so interesting perspectives from the Netherlands, what is uh, happening there and what is uh, viewed as important aspects to, to grasp. Uh, so social sustainability is for sure uh, something that I can see emerging out of that. Let's in that case, see what, what does Grant have to say? What about your perspective? So I'm gonna shut my screen down and allow you to present your thoughts. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Goran, and I look forward to meeting you there, Andrea. Um, I really look forward to it. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, can you see that? So, um, my name is Goran Mills. Um, I'm a um, professor in healthcare infrastructure delivery uh, in the UK, in London, at the uh, University College London, Bartlett. And um, I'm really interested in talking to you about you know, where we are as the UK and what we're trying to do in terms of uh, design and delivery. 
So the context of, of where we are, we, we're trying to deliver as a national health service 40 new hospitals. We're looking at how we can refurbish uh, 70 existing hospitals as well as uh, develop 100 new diagnostics hubs. Those of course are uh, nationally funded as part of the NHS. Um, at a time where there is significant pressure on our infrastructure, significant challenges associated with our ICUs, with our A&E units or emergency departments, and you know, significant patient weights for operating theatres and, uh, and surgery. It's at a point where we are fundamentally challenging the way that we go about healthcare planning and design, and we're trying to, to find new ways to articulate um, what it is uh, that we can do to be more interdisciplinary in the way that we can design and, and co-create uh, that evidence base. You will have no doubt seen uh, some of the work that's going on around the Wolfson Economic Prize and the contributions to make, that were made to that. Um, I think what's interesting there is that the dialogue and the debate is being had much more widely than it's been, been had before. There's uh, clinical colleges, there's um, GPs and surgeons involved in this discussion about what is healthcare um, for the future um, and how do we achieve it. Um, some of the questions that are emerging um, in the UK particularly is you know, how are we going to prioritise what we're going to design? You know, what is the hospital of the future? How are we going to innovate? And where are we going to innovate in terms of you know, whether we're going to achieve net zero, whether we're going to achieve modern methods of construction of ventilation, or how are we going to do all of these in a more integrative way? We're starting to look at how do we innovate? Where should we be innovating and who should own IP in relation to that? Who should be involved in that design process and who should be managing it? Or should we move, be moving towards you know, the tripartite agreement in integrated project delivery with the, the architect, the client and the contractor much more strongly uh, integrated? We're, we're challenging the way that we go about um, measuring the outcomes and impacts and methodologies that we use there and uh, the approach that we're taking to ensure um, greater levels of consistency of delivery on site through uh, approaches such as modular and modern methods of construction. I think we are also starting to think again about what is it to have a series of design standards, guidance and tools. And we're looking again at how we can create greater certainty uh, of design, design management, and trying to uh, mitigate the impacts of disruptive design changes. This is, of course, at a time where um, you know, things are changing significantly and you know, there is you know, a huge amount of work that's ongoing uh, on the right hand side here, looking at how we can, as the NHS, move to more digitally uh, informed uh, experience through the uh, um, uh, NHS X, uh, which is our institute, which is looking for how, how we can use uh, machine learning and advanced um, data analytics to improve the process of, of delivery and how we can respond um, through the Beneficial Change and Impact Network, which is a nationally funded centre that is looking for sharing 3,000 uh, case studies of experiences that happened during COVID-19 to, to change the way we go about delivering care. In this middle ground is, is, is where we as a construction industry need to respond to that change, not only respond to your local uh, situations in digital, but also uh, national demands and pressures put on that construction industry, whether they're coming through our, our national um, treasury or government or, or cabinet office or through the Department of Health. And we need to find ways to deliver cost efficiencies and cost savings in design um, that are not just repeating and replicating what we've built before. One of the ways that we're looking to do that is we're looking to, to find new ways to, to look beyond the hospital, to look at um, valuing um, the movement of, of patients in lower acuity levels and to challenge our system and how we can organise that system with a recognition that the severity of disease um, and that combined with COVID around issues associated with, with isolation means that what we have previously done is not what we potentially should be doing uh, for the future. So I'm gonna give you two examples of projects that we've been involved with uh, directly. 
Um, these are two uh, sites. One of them is in a new real estate situation, a shopping, shopping centre in uh, Brent Cross in London. The other one is in Coventry. It's a demonstration site, part of the Manufacturing Technology Centre. Um, what was um, very clear when we started um, working with uh, Moorfields as, as an example of, of one of the, the hospitals that has um, engaged with us was, was that a lot of the um, kind of knowledge that was coming out of their schemes and their projects over the last um, five, six years ha hadn't really been um, you know, effectively learned from. They'd taken different approaches to streaming flows, to clustering rooms, to organizing equipment. Um, and there's quite a lot of uncertainty with, with the way that um, they were looking at how they could address COVID-19 in, in a future uh, diagnostics hub. So we worked with them to develop a more uh, rapid approach to prototyping. We were one of a number of parts of the UCL that came together to really challenge uh, what they could do and how they could innovate, innovate into the future. One of the things that we did with them is we developed a research design uh, with a whole series of par uh, parties which would allow us to iterate uh, through uh, three different cycles of design, uh, which were co-created with the clinicians and co-created with a number of diff different kind of academic and um, industry participants. Those include architects, healthcare planner, planners, Internet of Things and sensor manufacturers, CFD modelers, ergonomics and mathematical modelers, design for manufacturing assembly and uh, space syntax um, uh, modelers. We also incorporated lighting designers and uh, uh, discrete event simulators. The purpose here was to try to understand how we could stream patients through a, a diagnostics hub, hub to reduce the time they spend inside in uh, clinical diagnostics, but also to find new configurations that would reduce error, increase value, and um, increase the experience of not only the, the um, staff, but also the, also the patient. So that was uh, one example. Another example is uh, the work that we're doing with the Manufacturing T Technology Centre and the um, NHS to look at a specific situation, to look at an operating theatre and to look for you know, how we can bring together a whole series of industrial partners around this area of significant complexity and challenge. We're trying to use more uh, advanced modern methods of construction and trying to reduce the carbon intensity of what is a significantly high carbon centre. The only way that we can do that is to design together to design early using specialist supply chain um, to make sure that um, you know, all parties are you know, trying to set targets and to innovate around that setting. Um, you know, finally, just to say who we are in terms of the Bartlett, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring together a whole number of different specialists from design and planning through into sustainable buildings, uh, through into public health and global uh, global. Um, Kind of south problems in the built environment. Along with our um, clinical partners, um, we've got two associated biomedical research centres, Great Ormond Street, Moorfields and GCLH, uh, with 21 um, hospitals as part of UCR partners. Thank you, Goran. Thank you. Um, a clear indication of the challenges that uh, meeting new challenges with new processes and new ways of working. Uh, and hopefully we can get back to that. I got the question here before about the uh, diagnostic hub, but is that a sort of a primary care unit or center of sorts, or what is a di diagnostic hub in your world? You have to put your mic on, Grant. Um, um, medical retina and glaucoma, and it's uh, processing patients through in a, um, in a shopping center. So it's in a primary care location, but it's a virt virtual clinic, which is meaning that there isn't clinicians on site. It's a uh, technician-led centre that's providing information for uh, uh, for clinicians to review uh, in a different setting. Okay, great. Uh, making a quick sharing here, uh, looking at the screen, uh, we would have uh, now a um, Stefano. Uh, is Stefano around, Andrea, or should we continue? 
I think it's better if we continue with the Marcio, probably, because I don't see him uh, with the video. Okay. Are you ready, Marcio, to show, share your presentation and do your presentation? Okay, here we go. Great with flexibility. So uh, over to you then, Thanks. Marcio. Thank you. I hope uh, you all listen to me into, uh, well. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, um, what I want to show you uh, today is a summary of uh, a seminar that we had uh, last week here in Brazil. Um, I am part of uh, association ABDAH, EH. Uh, it's a national association uh, comprised mostly of architects, but we also have uh, engineers and um, ad hospital administrators, nursing people, but mostly uh, we are comprised of architects that work in the healthcare uh, area, the, the healthcare system. Um, we organized uh, uh, some congresses and events uh, during the year. Uh, and last uh, week, we just had our first um, digital, uh, our second actually, digital seminar. Uh, this year was supposed to, hit, uh, to be our congress, but we had to postpone it again to, to next year. So we decided to have our second uh, online digital seminar. And this uh, actually happened Thursday and Friday last week. And so what I'm going to show you right now is uh, a summary of uh, what went on in this seminar um, to answer this question, what's going on here in terms of uh, design. Um, so we had um, um, studies that were presented, also some projects. Uh, we invited some speakers from, uh, from some other countries as well. So we had uh, Taifero from Canada, uh, Pineda from Spain, uh, Briseida and Edgar from Mexico, and Luciano from Argentina. And also we had many friends coming uh, from different parts of Brazil. We offered two uh, short courses as well. And we had uh, a case session where people, our associates, actually, this was exclusive for uh, ABDH uh, associates. So they, they could send studies and projects developed uh, in the last three years. So what you see now, uh, you're gonna see are projects that have been recently developed uh, in Brazil. So I'm gonna, I, I chose 10 cases to show you uh, very quickly. Um, the first case is a floating hospital for the Amazon. This, uh, this is uh, a project that was developed by Joaquin, a friend of ours, and um, it's meant to be used in the Amazon region where there are many rivers, the, the big rivers, and there is need for changing um, uh, the location of healthcare um, services. So he developed this, uh, this idea of a floating hospital that uh, could be moved from one place to another and also could be enlarged as, as needed, as you can see here. So, uh, so Joaquin presented this case uh, last week in our seminar. Um, I also would like to show you a few of um, the new hospitals that are being developed in Brazil. There, there's been a lot of investment in the private sector in hospitals. And the, the, there are many chains of uh, their buying new hospitals and uh, renewing them. This is one case. This was uh, this was a hospital that was um, uh, in Brasilia, and this chain, uh, the Hedidor, um, bought uh, the hospital and converted it to a new hospital. So this is uh, this is what we call now the six star hospitals that are, they are developing in Brazil. So we have this uh, DF star, which uh, was just um, um, finished. 
and it's a, it's an example of this type of hospitals that are, are being developed for this this particular private uh, institution. So uh, we have um, nice ambience. Um, everything is uh, is more or less the same in this chain. So um, from the same chain uh, comes this project, the Memorial Star. This is a, a brand new one. Is uh, actually uh, an extension, an expansion of an existing hospital that they're developing right now. Um, it just goes to show you the type of uh, uh, development that uh, this new chain, the, the star chain is uh, developing here in Brazil right now. So uh, you see that they follow more or less the same pattern, the, the same type of uh, uh, ambience. Well, uh, there was presented also an uh, interesting case. This is a project that's been developed. Actually, the, they're, they're almost finishing the, the work right now. Uh, it's, uh, it's a project by Safety Architects uh, in association with Perkins and Will. And they're developing this uh, research and education center for, for the Albert Einstein Institution in Sao Paulo. This is a very interesting case. This was uh, our main uh, presentation in the seminar. Um, and the, uh, here, the, the engineering company showed uh, what they done in this project, which is develop all the, the engineering projects in, in, with the BIM um, tool. Also, uh, Women's Public Hospital presented by, also by Joaquin is um, it's a, a new development. It's for the public network. It's, uh, it's going on right now. The, the, the foundations were laid and they're starting work right now in this new hospital, uh, which is for the public, um, for the public network, the, 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 uh, for all the people. And, and here you, you see uh, some images of this, um, this project. Also, this is a uh, project for also for a private uh, institution was developed by our friend Bia. Uh, and just show some images. Bia is uh, researching um, um, in, the, um, in the fields of uh, uh, research based design and, and uh, applying this also biophilic design and uh, applying this in her uh, designs. This is a brand new uh, project, it hasn't started yet. Um, also, this is a brand new one, uh, um, birth center in Salvador by our friend Doris. Uh, this, uh, the birth center is uh, for, also for uh, a private institution. And here you can see uh, um, very, very briefly the project. Uh, also for the start network, this is from another firm, RAF Architecture is from uh, a firm from Rio, and they're showing here also um, a brand new design for a new what they call the, the six star uh, hospital in uh, in Sao Paulo. So uh, as you see, you can see this. Um, um, complete design with uh, oncology treatment uh, center. Uh, from uh, Sigbert Zanettini, who is uh, one of the most important architects uh, in this field here in Brazil, we have this also brand new uh, design, the Montichiari uh, Hospital. Uh, he just showed this for the first time. Uh, it's, a, it's a brand new design. So um, um, he's showing here, uh, uh, all the, the, um, the plans and how uh, Zanichini is known for, for his uh, uh, pioneer use of uh, metallic structures here in Brazil. And this is uh, the last case I'm going to show you. Uh, this is a brand new hostel he's uh, uh, designing and finishing actually uh, the construction in Salvador. Uh, this is a, a vertical hospital. And he uses the metallic structure. Here's the, the you can see how it's laid out uh, in the field. And this has been under construction for, for the past year. 
and it's almost uh, com uh, completion right now. It's in the city of Salvador, Bahia, uh, in a very difficult location, uh, which is right now uh, under a lot of uh, discussions between architects uh, if this was uh, supposed to be a place for a new hospital as, a bi as big as this one. So just goes to show you what's going on in Brazil right now in terms of design of uh, hospitals. And here's an invitation if you, if you wanna join and follow uh, what's going on here. We invite you to, to, to follow those links and, and follow us. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, a lot of interesting projects there. Uh, in urban environments, a lot of them. Uh, what happens on, on in the non-urban environment, Marcia? Do you have any comment on that? Oh, here in Salvador, you mean? Yeah, well, in Brazil. Yeah. Do you see any trend oh. the, uh, on the, the less populated areas? Oh, there, there are many. Uh, we received uh, uh, some, uh, some projects from all over. So mm -hmm. there is also smaller projects, but Nothing uh, that I could, uh, you know, uh, show you as a, as a brand new design. Uh, there's more of the same, but um, uh, we have been uh, seeing a lot of uh, investment in the private sector. The, the Brazil, a uh, couple, uh, five years ago, more or less, uh, start opened the, the, the market, the, the healthcare markets for international firms. So what we have here right now is a kind of... Uh, a boom of investment that's starting to happen right now in Brazil with the private sector. Uh, okay, so in uh, say 20 years time, we will have a refurbishment seminar with you and the others in Brazil. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> what the developments have been so far. Uh, now we're going, going to move over to Italy to Stefano Capolongo. Uh, I have to share the screen with you here for a second. Uh, the current uh, structures like this, we had Presentation with Andrea from Netherlands, Grant UK, Amatio Brazil, and now we're moving into Italy before we will finish off before the break with David and Angeli from US. So over to you then, Stefano. Um, good to have you with us. I know you've been busy in meetings and actually we were at the conference already this morning. <laughs> so yeah. it's well on the, on, on the web today, uh, but uh, over to you, Stefano. Okay, uh, good afternoon to everybody. I thank Goran for inviting me. Yes, this morning uh, he was uh, in uh, our National Congress uh, of the Italian Center for Healthcare Building and Technologies. So I'm Stefano Capolongo, professor in hospital design and uh, urban health uh, and uh, uh, the research coordinator design and health lab uh, at uh, Politecnico di Milano. So in my presentation, I will share some uh, concepts about the Italian situation on uh, healthcare facilities between uh, past, present, and uh, future. So in the past, design uh, in Italian is progettare, uh, which means to throw forward. But uh, in order to understand the contemporary and the future challenge is always important to start from the past. Uh, so uh, hospital facilities are complex construction. They are the translation of social, uh, epidemiological, uh, economic transformation into the physical space. For example, we know that the first Lazaret was built in Venice for uh, isolating sick people uh, with the black plague. And uh, uh, we also know that the Cagranda Hospital in Milano, designed by Filarete, uh, served uh, as a hospital building uh, uh, for more than uh, 400 years with uh, uh, already an important uh, design uh, future in uh, terms of uh, hygiene and public health strategies. Uh, so uh, in the past, uh, in the past uh, uh, hospitals uh, could uh, serve uh, for hundreds of uh, years. Uh, with time, this life uh, uh, span uh, uh, shorted uh, due uh, to the uh, increased complexity of technology and also the rapid transformation of uh, medical practice uh, and uh, uh, equipments. 
Uh, hospital today age very fast becoming uh, uh, so obsolete, especially in the Italian, but in general in Europe context. We know that the, the common life cycle is about uh, 40 or 50 years, but uh, as uh, uh, average, uh, it uh, take 10 years to build a new uh, once so they burn uh, already hold. Today we estimated that 17% uh, 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 of hospital are obsolete uh, over the uh, optimal lifespan and 50% uh, of uh, tools uh, uh, cannot host the current organization model. And uh, um, a medicine is evolving very fast. And uh, uh, I want to, to uh, and also the challenge uh, that we uh, imagined to face were uh, completely accelerated or uh, um, this disrupted by COVID-19 pandemic that it, Italy among the first uh, country in Europe and in the world. This is a video, very fast uh, video uh, pro projected uh, at the Venice Architectural Exhibition uh, to the Biennale about the hospital of the, uh, the future and uh, by Roma Studio. And it's, I think it's very interesting for uh, rethink the, uh, the future of hospital uh, where is very important uh, the uh, relation between the hospital and the city and uh, very important to put the uh, human person uh, in the, uh, the center of the design hospital. And uh, in, in this video it's very uh, clear uh, today that the, the big challenge for the new hospital is an uh, old concept, but uh, today it's uh, very uh, important to introduce the uh, flexibility, the resilience of the hospital. Because uh, during the COVID-19, several challenges were faced in Italy, but also in the rest of the world. And uh, the great needs of fle flexible space uh, uh, emerged. 70% of the operating room have been transformed in the first COVID-19 uh, uh, wave uh, to host uh, in pension or uh, intensive care unit. And there, there was a rapid increase of COVID-19 pension in, uh, in pension room and uh, in uh, intensive care unit room and the later in uh, rehabilitation room. And I think there was a very uh, everyday uh, request of oxygen, for example, for respiratory problems of several patients, uh, creating uh, difficulties in the hospital uh, system. Uh, so, the prevention, the promotion of the health, the innovation today with the digitalization is very uh, important to introduce because uh, the design uh, project to translate the uh, different uh, approach in physical space. And uh, we got to conclude this, uh, this video. But if you don't have the opportunity to visit the Biennale in Venice, uh, it's very, uh, I think, uh, interesting the, this, uh, this approach.
okay. So in the present, uh, in the last two years, uh, all the hospital design was focused on the COVID-19 hospital, but uh, we forgot uh, everything about the hospital of the future. Several times experts said that it was better a pavilion hospital, for example, uh, rather than a, a modern hospital. Maybe it, it, uh, it's true for COVID-19 reasons, but not for the hospital of the future. And therefore, uh, as the, uh, my department, uh, ABC, uh, Architecture and Building Environment and Co Engineering Construction, we decide to collect uh, all the design strategy uh, then can face COVID-19, but also improve uh, the quality and the no innovation of the hospital environments. Uh, the 10 strategies are, I, I go very fast. The first is uh, the, the strategic lo localization. I feel is the precondition for uh, uh, the new hospital accessibility and the other uh, requirement. The second is flexibility and resilience. The third is building typology, functional planning, specific uh, functional area, for example, emergency department and the intensive care unit. I think it's important to rethink this part of the hospital. User uh, center, uh, in particular, uh, the, the new area in the hospital uh, for the staff, uh, and for example, the presence of the green area and the hilly garden. Uh, we have an important uh, survey in uh, Polymy uh, during the, the lockdown uh, for measuring the anxiety and the stress uh, of the uh, hospital uh, staff. Uh, the seven is uh, very important uh, to define the indoor air quality, ventilation system and product emission. The eight is innovative in ecoactive materials, the new materials, uh, antiviral, antibacterial, uh, photocatalytic materials. The nine is the digitalization, it's very important uh, today. And the 10 is the health promotion and prevention. In particular, the keywords uh, are community houses, uh, community hospital, and uh, rehabilitation uh, center. And uh, we have, uh, uh, these strategies have been uh, published in, in Index Public Health Journal. The future, uh, two aspects uh, that COVID-19 accelerated are important to understand the future challenges for hospital, uh, uh, for hospital uh, design. The PNR, uh, the, the National Plan for Recovery and the Resilience uh, coming from Next Generation Europe Fund is not uh, focused on the hospital facility. On the contrary, uh, the fund are going to renovate or building new territorial health facilities and uh, to increase the level of digitalization and sustainability of uh, existing hospital. So, and uh, uh, investment uh, 6.1 is about the proximity networks uh, uh, intermediate structure and uh, telemedicine for territorial health care. In Italy, we will uh, build uh, or renovate uh, 308 community hospitals and uh, 1,000 community homes. Uh, the challenge is uh, because uh, none know uh, how to design them. Uh, we are uh, supporting the National Agency for Regional Services in uh, understanding how uh, to do it. Uh, the second investment line is about innovation, research and digitalization of the National Health Service. Uh, the objective is to improve the sustainability and safety uh, in the hospitals, but uh, there are found only for uh, uh, seismic uh, uh, complex uh, activities. I think it's uh, the, the, the big challenge is to introduce the tool for measurement. For example, uh, we uh, developed uh, this tool about uh, flexibility evaluation. And in this direction, we have other important tool, for example, the, for measuring the sustainability and the quality uh, assessment. And uh, we are testing this tool on uh, uh, 15 uh, hospital uh, in Italy and in Germany. And the other challenge are the other tool, but I don't have a time for describe. 
And uh, the last uh, very uh, important experience uh, are the uh, new, mod new uh, model for the massive vaccination center. And uh, we have a, a very small video, but uh, probably I don't have a, a time for the presentation, but I go to conclude it, my presentation with the new challenge experience. And I think the new challenge is uh, the evidence-based design, but in the same time, the evidence-based uh, uh, practices. And I think the future must be both evidence-based and practice-based to innovative hospital facility design in Italy and around, around the, uh, the world. This is the last uh, experience uh, with my research group. Uh, is the modeling uh, for the passing uh, center. Okay, I go to conclude it. The last uh, uh, image is that the new challenge is next week with a new expert meeting about the future hospital with the World Health Organization and several institutions. Thank you very much. Sorry for my long presentation. No worries, Stefano. A lot of good information there. Uh, and uh, it's important. And that's also one of the purposes with this uh, seminar and webinar today to, to exchange. Okay. But um, also in order to enable our colleagues from the US to have a presentation before the break, I uh, hereby jumping across the Atlantic from Sweden to David and Anjali. Over to you. Thank you, Goran, and thank you. It was, it was great. It's hard to follow those uh, presentations. Very uh, informative and entertaining and, and mine may be uh, a little bit drier. Uh, but uh, I'm going to try to share my screen after I get this going. And uh, uh, let's see if I can now find a way to uh, get this. Now, once I do that, wait a minute. Uh, I got to exit show. Find a way to get this up here so I can do this. Now, get to multiple screens sometimes are challenging. And now I seem to lose the ability to, um, to share a screen. Why does it not work now? Okay, I'm going to share the screen. Uh, and uh, share. Okay, and then I want to do this. Can you see my screen? The full screen or the presentation? Yes. Go on. Okay, good. All right, so um, I'm going to give a little update basically on what's been happening here in the U.S. Thank you, Goran, for inviting us. It's been very uh, interesting to listen to what's happening around the world, uh, some very entertaining presentations. Uh, so I'm going to be really focusing on what are the recent trends in the United States uh, with COVID and beyond and what's been happening? Of course, this image is, I put this up here to show how large and diverse the US is, uh, similar to Brazil in terms of its geography and diversity from very urbanized and rural and very large facilities to very small facilities. Uh, and often the conditions here are very different from place to place. But I'm going to try to generalize from a very high altitude view as an academic who's connected into practice here in the United States and, and, and listening to what my uh, former students and the firms that we work with uh, around the country have they been experiencing over the last several years and what's coming forward as a result of that. So some of the general trends here in the U.S., uh, design and construction activity really didn't slow down as a 
portion of work in healthcare as a result of COVID, uh, but really shifted, pivoted very quickly to adapting and responding to uh, the pandemic. Uh, of course, virtual work uh, from home um, is, is kind of the new reality. Firms are still working in a hybrid mode. A lot of people are still working out of their homes. Uh, the challenge was in onboarding new staff, particularly graduates of, uh, of architecture programs. Although all of our graduates in the last several years were immediately hired, but waited, they, they waited to bring them on board uh, for several months uh, until they could uh, bring them in person and off, in some cases uh, partially. Uh, our, the firms found that virtual client meetings actually had greater participation in person, certainly saved a lot of travel time and became a very efficient and effective way uh, to work in developing projects. Some of the long-term projects were put on hold. Projects that were under construction were adapted and are accelerated. Uh, but now the firms are really showing that planning design activity is shifting, significantly ramping up and shifting to beyond COVID thinking. So a lot of projects and thinking that was put on hold um, to refocus during the, uh, the height of the pandemic are now really uh, being released and being rethought. Uh, what that's yielding is a significant shortage of qualified healthcare design professionals in the United States. Um, and so um, with what I really wanna focus on is what I think of the universal forces driving healthcare and healthcare design. Some of those were touched on uh, by uh, some of the previous presentations uh, but I wanted to talk about how COVID has maybe reframed some of those uh, going into the future, at least here in the United States. Of course, that includes operational efficiency, effectiveness, and safety, a core um, mandate, optimizing human health and health outcomes for patients, staff, communities, and the environment, optimizing the healthcare experience. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and the refocusing uh, on staff um, as, as, a, as a primary concern. And then optimizing resiliency and the ability to accommodate change, both evolutionary and the sudden kind of changes that we've witnessed here recently. So in terms of optimizing operational efficiency, effectiveness and safety, I mean, the way COVID and, and rethinking has, has reframed this is, is really the need to nimbly adjust to new work processes, workflows and practices. Uh, and we're finding out that some of the older facilities uh, really did not accommodate that very effectively. Accommodating PPE, increased intensive care capacity, uh, and isolating infected populations within healthcare facilities became real challenges and are gonna be a greater focus in the future. The ability to screen, triage, move, and segregate patients, uh, providing adequate space and safe passageways into and through facilities is, 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 a, is an increasing concern. Um, and then the ability to create pandemic response settings and surge capacity quickly. Some of the health systems here in the United States um, created designated hospitals within their systems where they shunted COVID patients to those particular places. Uh, and then of course, temporary pop-up settings, some of which weren't really fully utilized. Uh, then the ability to adequately staff facilities in an era of ever growing staff shortages. I mean, we are facing a, a healthcare worker shortage here in the United States going into COVID. The staff burnout as a result of COVID uh, is uh, you know, indicated to healthcare organizations that they really need to pay even greater attention to staff retention, staff satisfaction, staff reduction. Um, and then the ability to acquire adequate materials and equipment. Many healthcare systems went to uh, more of a just-in-time acquisition and distribution processes, which led to uh, supply chain issues uh, early on in the pandemic and, um, and, and getting enough of, of the, the, the equipment and, and materials needed to, to care for this rapid surge in, in patient care. Um, then optimizing health and health, health, health outcomes, um, you know, how to protect staff uh, during routine uh, uh, periods, but also during uh, unique periods like we've just experienced. How to accommodate uh, in, uh, the increasing use and need for telehealth health. here in the United States, and I suspect around the world, it increased dramatically. Uh, almost all routine visits were handled by telehealth. 
uh, and the need to really increase the robustness of those delivery models in the United States is becoming apparent. We're looking for how the reimbursement from the federal government uh, will help, will continue to support that. The healthcare organizations got waivers um, during the um, during the pandemic to uh, to go to uh, reimbursement for telehealth. Uh, the ability to address increasing needs for behavioral health care. That's been a growing demand here in the United States. Uh, and, and it's not just um, uh, the stresses uh, of uh, the normal stresses of life, but the increased stressors of COVID, particularly on healthcare workforce. Uh, the ability to move to non-critical care services out of the hospital. Of course, a lot of, uh, in the United States, we have a, 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 a fee for service model by and large. And uh, surgical procedures are, are a major source of uh, income and, uh, for healthcare organizations. And those had to be suspended uh, during COVID uh, by and large. And so the idea of moving to more ambulatory care services, pushing them out of the hospital into appropriate outpatient settings where potentially operations can continue with proper screening. Uh, then the ability to uh, provide uh, protected outdoor spaces. We're seeing thoughts in hospital design now for the ability to surge and, and, and provide screening, triage, waiting, and other non-clinical functions uh, you know, outside the front door of the hospital in, in, in areas around in covered and protected places uh, or in pop-up facilities even on campus. Uh, then optimizing the healthcare experience. Um, again, like I said earlier, uh, how to better address staff health and well-being, um, increasing the awareness of the need for break and respite spaces, providing greater access to daylight, access to nature in staff areas, which in the United States is well behind uh, Europe and many parts of the world in dealing with that um, in our healthcare facilities. And then the ability to make healthcare um, more accessible and distributed by increasing demand and acceptance of, of um, telehealth, increasing focus on decentralized and distributed care settings, much like was talked about in, in the UK. Um, and then the ability to accommodate family engagement safely. COVID pro prohibited families from coming in. We understand that family engagement in the care process is a valuable uh, part uh, of healthcare, particularly here in the United States, uh, and it yields better outcomes. And how to do that when you, you can't physically be in contact with patients becomes really important. Of course, then finally, um, you know, to optimize the ability to accommodate changing needs um, in terms of new kinds of surge response. We were very well prepared generally in the United States for natural and man-made disasters. They seem to be happening regularly here, uh, but we weren't prepared for the kind of biological disaster response that we experienced with COVID. Uh, and so how to deal with that new kind of surge response is really a, a key focus of healthcare organizations because we don't expect this to go away in the, in the near future. And then finally, you know, the ability to safely triage, screen, and care for infectious patients, um, uh, you know, protected screening and triage areas uh, outside the ED, uh, flexible mechanical systems, uh, and, and possibly increased natural ventilation is my hope that we'll get a refocus on that here in the United States. Uh, again, we're behind much of the rest of the world in that. Um, and then converting a range of spaces in the hospital to pandemic care settings, everything from um, pre-op and post-op spaces in surgery uh, that became temporal uh, ICU units uh, to spaces even in hallways that could accommodate the surge of patients uh, in places. Then the ability to separate pathways through the hospital for patient transport with dedicated lifts and separated corridors. Uh, and the ability to provide universal acuity adaptable care spaces, uh, the surge capacity in the ED uh, to acuity adaptable inpatient rooms, units, and wards throughout the hospital. The firms are saying those are some of the pressures that, that they're, uh, and, 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 and issues and drivers that they're facing from their clients and the projects going forward. Uh, so I know I'm a little bit uh, over, we're a little bit over, so I'll kind of wrap it up with that. Uh, but I just wanted to summarize again that these were some of the uh, how 
how some of these universal forces are being reconsidered and rethought as a result of the last several years that we've experienced. Thank you, Goran and everyone. Thank you. Great points to bring into discussion. So it's over to Anjali then. I'm going to stop sharing. Yes. Yeah. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Hello, everyone. Good morning to some, good evening to others. Uh, but very nice to see you all. And thank you, Goran, uh, for inviting us to come and speak with you. Um, I am going to talk a little bit. Uh, it's a bit of a follow up to what David just spoke about. But I'm focusing on research in the United States and what have been some trends and some challenges that uh, researchers have faced in relation to healthcare design and what are the opportunities going forward. Um, and, and just as a quick introduction, uh, my role at Clemson, I work very closely with David, uh, but I'm the director of the Center for Health Facilities Design and Testing. And we do research on the design of the built environment, on patient safety, um, patient experience, all the things that David talked about. So uh, there is a lot of alignment obviously in our presentations in some ways. So today I wanted to give you a brief overview based on my perspective of what I have been uh, seeing um, in terms of trends and publications and things coming out. Um, research in practice. Uh, there is a pretty strong um, healthcare design research um, sort of entity in the United States in many architecture firms, and they have been doing their own kind of work. Uh, and I'll talk about research in academia. And then, you know, finally, uh, very quickly, I'll talk about a conference that we are organizing next year, which has a theme very much responsive to COVID and all the things that we've seen over here. Um, so in terms of research and practice, what I have observed and what, what's been evident uh, is the kind of work that architecture firms have been looking at is providing thought leadership around uh, response to COVID-19. Um, so I'm sure in relation to what's been visible in the other countries as well, uh, architecture firms have been trying to quickly respond to what are the challenges, uh, what do we need to do, um, what kind of, you know, dealing with the same problems that everybody has been. Is it about surfaces? Is it about air quality? Uh, what does it mean for workplaces, all of that. Uh, and then the second sort of category of research that I've seen is uh, research to support facility adaptations in response to COVID-19 challenges. So David talked about many of the challenges that uh, architecture firms have dealt with, what are some of the ideas moving forward. Um, so the researchers and firms have been working with their clients to support some of these challenges. And, and then where what I'm seeing now is that many of the architecture firms are working with their clients to do post-occupancy evaluation. So example, HKS Architects is working with the military health system to evaluate uh, several of their um, hospitals to understand how they're responding to COVID-19 adaptations and what are the elements that are being successful and what, what is not. Um, so these are just some examples of uh, papers or publications, web publications that are out there that kind of give you a sense of the type of topics. And, and this is not just healthcare, it's probably more than that. There was a lot of conversation about turning hotels into hospitals and how that could help fill a need uh, in a surge situation. Um, then, you know, the need for flexible labs and research environments. We've been thinking about that everywhere. What's the impact of COVID on schools? What's the impact of COVID on workplaces? Uh, that has been going on for a while. And then, you know, you can see this is a paper from Gensler where they're talking about the different concepts about airport design, um, equity and daily commute, uh, hybrid workplaces. So these are sort of the big issues that uh, that are kind of coming across um, uh, that architecture firms are trying to deal with and provide some thought leadership there. <laughs> Uh, the other kind of things that we're talking about in practice-based research, but probably in all kinds of research, is hybrid workplaces, and uh, not just in healthcare facilities, but everywhere. Uh, the, use, the infection control has obviously become a big issue. Uh, initially, it was the whole discussion about smart materials and the stuff that we are familiar with in healthcare facilities already. How do you provide facilities? materials that are you know easier to clean uh, that have properties that support infection control but how do these then translate into other kinds of environments um, designed to support sanitation and hand washing becomes more important than ever before uh, a big focus on ventilation and ventilation strategies which we have in hospitals but what do we do to increase the capacity to provide um, care for infectious patients but that that has been a struggle in the us um, and I'm sure in other hospitals as well. 
what kind of screening procedures can we put in place uh, in terms of uh, doing research in, in, in different situations. In the US, there's been a big focus on um, disparities uh, and that has driven a lot of the research and the thinking uh, in practice-based research. And I think in the years to come, hopefully in academic research as well, what are, health, what are the kind of healthcare disparities that are visible in healthcare uh, organizations and what is the role of design in, in supporting equity? Uh, impact of telemedicine, that, that you know, it was happening even prior to COVID, but COVID has just taken it to a different level. And uh, everyone from all researchers, healthcare systems, they're all thinking about what is the impact of telemedicine? How is it going to make a difference in the future? And alternative care sites, in the early days of COVID, there was a lot of research and a lot of practice work happening in terms of providing alternative care sites that could meet all the requirements for infection control, but increase the capacity of the hospitals. And then finally, you know, this is what we've all been talking about. What does the healthcare facility of the future look like in terms of responsiveness to pandemics or other disasters that might occur? How do we future-proof the facilities for the next pandemic? Um, and that, that's, that's a lot of discussion that's been going on. Uh, but in terms of research in academia, it's varied in scope and topic. Um, unlike, you know, publications coming out on the websites from architecture firms, uh, research in academia tends to be much slower and it tends to be published in peer-reviewed journals. So it's there is stuff coming out already, uh, but it's going to take a little longer to see what that research is in terms of healthcare design, um, what, what's happening. But the topics of focus are very similar. Um, there has been a challenge that we've all faced in terms of doing research um, in the last couple of uh, years because of lack of uh, access to facilities. Uh, you know, we had a project we were working on with the Medical University of South Carolina. We were going to go in and do observations of uh, anesthesia providers and to understand medication safety issues. Um, but because of COVID, clearly that was a big no. So we, we changed our methodology. We moved to observing videos and trying to understand what's going on with that. Uh, we've come up with alternative approaches such as Zoom calls. Uh, David referred to that, um, you know, having more virtual meetings, but even research is happening more virtually. Uh, we're using focus groups, we're doing interviews other alternatives to being in person. So that is changing a little bit. And I think researchers are going back into facilities uh, in a more controlled way, but that, that is the challenge even going forward. You know, what is it going to look like for researchers to be involved and to do the kind of re the work we do, which involves interacting with people, observing people. Uh, these are some of the hot topics that I see um, have been emerging and will continue to emerge in terms of very in-depth academic healthcare design research understanding, and, and this is not research that just architects or healthcare designers will do. I think all of this has to be multidisciplinary, working with colleagues in healthcare clinicians, um, health systems folks, industrial engineers, uh, psychologists. So it, it has to be a multidisciplinary effort in my, in my opinion. So I think the, the topics would be impact of telemedicine on care delivery and health facility needs. How big does the facility need to be? Where does it take place? Healthcare moving to the home. Uh, designing flex flexible and adaptable healthcare facilities to meet future emergency needs. And patient safety is always going to be important uh, in whatever situation, patient safety and staff safety. I think that's a big element that has been highlighted because of COVID, that not only do we need to make sure our patients are safe, but as we provide care, we have to keep our, fa our staff safe um, during uh, COVID and beyond because they will go back to their homes and they have to protect their families. Uh, a, a big area that I'm seeing emerging is designing for mental health and not just behavioral healthcare facilities, but just mental health being an important part of any kind of healthcare facility, any kind of facility, whether it's schools, uh, whether it's college campuses, uh, in all of those areas that becomes important. Uh, role of nature and outdoors. And then a big focus on staff burnout. Uh, you know, we are finding that staff is being bur is burnt out in U.S. hospitals. There seems to be no end to COVID. Uh, but what can we do in terms of designing spaces to prevent that? And then designing ventilation systems to support improved air quality. Uh, one of the projects that uh, we've worked on for many years is designing operating rooms. Um, and operating rooms are always designed with the assumption that they are positive pressure uh, to keep the patient safe. But with COVID, there was a big focus on protecting staff. Um, so do we make them negative pressure? How does that work in terms of patient safety? So I feel like that is still an issue that needs to be resolved 
uh, uh, now. And then these are some other topics that we've actually worked on at Clemson uh, specific to COVID-19. Uh, we did a project uh, with people at MUSC and in different disciplines trying to come up with COVID-19 testing sites in South Carolina and what would be the ways to identify the appropriate sites uh, that meet the needs of the population, the location, is it a rural uh, location, is it an urban location and so on. Uh, we've been looking at some of these ventilation design parameters for operating rooms during COVID and we have a grant proposal out uh, looking at that topic. Um, you know, we, we were looking at the impact of window views on patients during COVID and then there's a project that Dina Batista at Clemson is leading right now, looking at the mental health of students on campus and what are some of the challenges we need to face on that. And then finally, I'm just wrapping it up, uh, I wanted to mention that we are hosting a conference in uh, Clemson. Uh, this is the Environmental Design Research Association, which is an international organization that many of you will be familiar with. Um, EDRA is, uh, this is the 53rd conference and this coming uh, year, EDRA is hosting it in collaboration with Clemson. So we are our local host and the conference will be in Greenville, South Carolina, June 1st to the 4th. And the theme is health in all design. So really going to this thing that we are emerging from the pandemic, hopefully, or irrespective we are dealing with the pandemic and health needs to be the focus of all design, whether it's schools, whether it's workplaces, whether it's hospitals, how, how do we kind of promote health, equity, sustainability, and resilience through environmental design. So hopefully there will be some thought leadership around health in all design through this conference. And uh, these are some of the topics that we will be focusing on. So we have one more day to submit. Uh, the last date for submission of abstracts is December 1st. So if you haven't submitted yet, please do submit. We'd love to um, see people from all over the world at this conference. And I think that is it from me. So thank you, Anjali. It's it effectively, uh, now we all have to go and write abstracts tonight. <laughs> yes, you absolutely do. <laughs> Who is best positioned given time zoning. Anyway, thank you for uh, both your inputs here. Uh, I think it's time we all uh, run off to the coffee machines and then get back in 10 minutes for a discussion on, I have a list of things I noted here from all your presentations, and I hope that will be sufficient for, to guide us through the discussion. So thank you so far for all the interesting input and uh, thank you so far to all the listeners for being here with us. Uh, so it's a um, coffee break. See you in a, uh, well, in okay. 10 Right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a break when the, the coffee or tea or whatever. Um, just a comment from Johanna here. Hello, everyone. You have to mute, John. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, you can't see it, but I'm sitting next to both Asker and Joran here at Chalmers. Uh, and you uh, can see all the other panelists, but you don't know who else is listening. Uh, and we now reach the, the part of this webinar where we can be a little bit more interactive. But as a start of that, we, we would use the chat for that. Uh, but as a start for that, I, I want you who are not a pres invited presenter today and not a um, Swedish-based uh, listener um, to write your name and your affiliation and country in the chat to see who else is listening here. I can see that there is a majority of you is um, um, from Sweden and um, names that are um, part of our usual audience and some new ones. Um, but uh, if you are not, if you're uh, non-Swedish based and part of the audience, uh, write your affiliation and country. And I think your name will show as well. So we have a li little idea of who else is here and you will pop also see who else is here. Between 40 and 50 uh, persons joining us during the, this webinar. We'll go the box. And then I leave the work for you. So uh, um, having listened to all the presentation, it's, it's uh, 
I'm impressed by the variety of issues we are working with, but I think there's one thing that comes back actually, and that is um, uh, the uh, the challenges with the uh, with the well, actually, based on COVID, that's been a huge. Well, basically, we always know it's been insecure. It's always been challenging, but now it has sort of become. This is the way it is. It is going to be challenging. We will face new challenges regularly, and we will live with uncertainties. And I think that has been even more pronounced during the, the pandemic, uh, because that has been coming on top of all the other changes we have with sustainability, resources, and etc. So that that comes to mind. Um, then there was one word I saw in two places in two different presentations. One was in Andreas and one was in Marcio's presentations. The word humanization was uh, popping up there as well. And um, I think that's also a reflection of times, I think. So there are a number of interesting observations here in, in these presentations. But if we take my assumption that um, insecurity in how and what to design is uh, a key factor of our future design processes, any thoughts on that from the panelists? The debate is open. Well, would you like to start, perhaps, uh, Grant? Well, I think it's, you know, thank you very much, Goran. It's a really interesting question, isn't it? Where, where do we start to redesign, redescribe our health service and the systems within it? I suppose we, um, we absolutely need to focus on uh, emergency departments. Uh, we absolutely have to focus on what we did during COVID, we in the UK, we refurbished a lot of operating theatres into ICU um, units. Um, we've got to get back uh, to um, delivering those operations, but creating flexibility and resilience for, for a future uh, pandemic situation. So I think there's, there's a lot we can be doing, but the most important thing is to learn from what we've done and to find capacity in the right place for the next time that it happens. Um, I'm not 100% sure we are learning and ca ca capturing that evidence as full as we, full, uh, as we could uh, be. We are doing some post occupancy evaluations in hospitals, um, you know, around five or six of them up and down the country. Uh, those are orchestrated by contractors or designers who want to understand they're not being nationally orchestrated or internationally orchestrated. And um, I would love to, to hear more about what others think we should be doing, but we absolutely should be collecting evidence. Any other thoughts on how to deal with the uh, now well-established fact that we, the unknown is here? <laughs> David. Well, it's, it's definitely a new reality. And I think um, what, what we're doing here today and what continues to be done is exchange globally. I mean, I think different uh, parts of the world come up with different solutions. Um, and, 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 and I think we all need to learn from each other. Um, I mean, some, some you know, great insights and work from different places uh, that have different contexts and different capacities and, and different areas of, of cultural concern related to health, but a lot of the core problems are the same. And I think if we just, uh, you know, continue to do these kind of international exchanges, you know, it always amazes me across all the presentations here. And um, I've been following the Wolfson Prize in, 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 uh, in, in England and um, in UK and, and, and what's happening on the continent in, in Europe and, and in South America, I mean, and around the world. Um, I think there's a lot of the same core issues. And, and I think uh, if we put our heads together collectively, um, then we can do a better job of solving them uh, and learning from each other. Yeah, I think as you say, uh, collaboration, knowledge sharing is, is a key here. Um, so how, how do we, uh, how do we connect uh, with you in Brazil, Marcio? And what do you need from us up here? <laughs> uh, nice question. Uh, I was just uh, uh, listening to David. And uh, when he says that uh, we're, we're kind of a global village right now, we're learning from each other all the time. 
And with these uh, online uh, events, online seminars, we, we have this opportunity to, to get even more integrated with our friends from Europe, also from the US and other places. Um, and it's always uh, very nice. And here in Brazil, uh, we are witnessing uh, a change also. The, the major international firms, architectural firms are, are coming to work in Brazil. Uh, and this wasn't the case uh, up to you know, a few years ago when the market was really, really tight and closed to international firms. But now with um, American firms like uh, Perkins and also um, now with, uh, with um, um, other firms from Canada as well. And uh, we're, we're seeing this uh, international design take over, uh, which you, you can analyze it from, from both sides. It's, uh, it's good because we have all the latest trends in design coming in and with also a very good quality in, in development but also you kind of lose a little bit um, the local flavor. Um, I, I understand that um, hospitals are looking more and more the same uh, all over the world with all the international features. Uh, but here, uh, I, I have to be honest, I, I miss some of the, the, the old and good architects from, from, from past, the past, uh, like, we have uh, Lele, which he's, he was a, a great influence in, for everybody here with uh, all the, uh, the sustainable architecture that uses the, the local conditions, the, the natural ventilation. Uh, and we're not seeing that anymore. Like we are, even though uh, with uh, COVID, we're, we're looking more into natural ventilation but what are, I'm seeing here in designs are, are more closed hospitals. It, it looks like uh, it, it, it doesn't fit. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're witnessing um, a change um, in the way design is approached. But also, uh, all the private hospitals that are being built right now, they don't look uh, to this type of architecture that's passive, uh, energy efficient. But um, I don't know, it's a big challenge. Like uh, uh, healthcare architecture is becoming uh, each day more and more international here in Brazil, but we also have to look to the past and see uh, where, where, the, where is the, the good architecture gone. <laughs> so uh, we have to, to learn from those and, and maybe for the future, try to, to make a balance between the, the two experiences. I, I... Good, good point, Marcio, and I agree with you. You have great historic traditions in, in healthcare architecture that I've, you know, I've studied some, and so there in Brazil. And, and I think I reflect back on that environmental uh, catchphrase, you know, think globally, but act locally. And so we need to find a way to not make the mistakes of, of uh, the international style and try to impose a, a singular kind of response uh, globally in our healthcare architecture. And, uh, and, and so we need to understand the things that are universal and, and but how to interpret them in a, in, a, in a contextual way to the culture and to the climates that we all have uniquely in our own countries and even within our own countries. So, um, uh, and so I think, I think it's really critical to balance those two things. So thank you for that comment. Yeah, I think we, so we should exchange knowledge, but not designs, basically, <laughs> to make a very quick summary of it. Uh, because I'd love to build a Swedish hospital on the countryside in Brazil. That I think that wouldn't work very well. <laughs> so any other thoughts on this topic and how we go forward from this? How do we, uh, you know, what, with exchanging information? Anjali? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to build upon uh, what Grant had mentioned a couple of minutes ago about the importance of learning from what we've all gone through and the fact that this is very much an international phenomena, whether it's India or it's Brazil, wherever. We've all had to deal with it and we've dealt with it in different ways. Um, and we, so we need some way of documenting that, I think. Um, you know, you'll have the occasional peer review journal article pop up somewhere, but that's just not enough. I think there's lots of learning on the ground that would be great to document somehow. Um, I know in the early days of COVID, the, in the US, the AIA 
had a database of sort where you could submit your projects to say, oh, this is what I'm dealing with, this is what I've done. And, and that was helpful, I think, for many people to see what was going on. Um, I haven't looked at it in a while, so I don't know where it's going and what's happening with it. But something similar that could be there where people could submit their projects, just work in progress, not a heavy peer review journal article, but to say, you know, we've done a post occupancy evaluation and we're finding for a facility of this size, uh, these kind of ORs or whatever, you know, will seem to work um, uh, with some evidence or something. And if we had standardized tools that everyone could use, I think that would be great. I mean, this is all ideal. I, I don't know which, where it would live and who would come up with these things, but just, just in terms of moving forward, we have to learn how to learn from the past and then actually use it in the future. Yeah, I mean, we're getting into one of the other subjects that I could actually see in, in the presentation. It started actually off with you, Andrea, uh, with the uh, Andrea Moen, the presentation on uh, talking with the users and participants and moving into the sort of social integration, social sustainability issues, which sort of brings you into a local context by default, if you say social sustainability, because you can't have social sustainability in a, in a too large scale. Any thoughts on that, Andrea? Yeah, it's great that you point out this topic because to, following the discussion, I thought, why can't we approach everything really from a human perspective? You know, we, we, we often start from a helicopter view and it's like a helicopter landing and then solving all these technical problems, but we forget the users. And actually, um, what uh, Marcio said, when, when you go back to what, what people really need, huh? imagine somebody, you, you really go back to the basics and to this old knowledge. And in Africa, it's very smart to, to create natural ventilation in, uh, under a roof, you know, things like that. Of course, you cannot do in Sweden, but, but work with these local typical things. And, um, and then you realize that uh, and healthcare environments get more human and and much better for for people um so for me it's always in my work and always the, the person centered and then you get to completely different solutions yeah and what more and if you do so they are more happy and in the end it's cheaper so <laughs> you can investigate in that yeah yeah, and I mean, today here in Sweden, we've got the local context all over the place. It's called snow. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> not, not everywhere. Not everywhere, <laughs> but most places anyway. And it does, of course, affect what we can design here with ventilation and with regards to temperature. Andrea Bramilia from Polimia, I've, I'm not sure if Stefano is still around, but he was speaking about uh, history and context. And uh, if you take that perspective, what, what do you see lying ahead of you? you were, he was presenting things about vaccination and new technologies. Uh, what do you see? Yeah, thank you very much for, for the question, Jarna, and, and thanks uh, to all for the contribution. Um, I think that starting also from what was presenting, uh, the relationship between the past, the present, and the future is really important. And we saw that today, uh, several uh, transformations in the healthcare environment that were made, uh, now uh, they are put under consideration to see if they actually work. Like as um, sometimes uh, several uh, architects or designers said, okay, but during COVID-19, uh, it was better to have pavilion hospitals because you could open the windows. And that worked very well for, for the COVID, but maybe it's not good for uh, sustainability reasons, according to the context. So I think that the challenge is also to um, create and to find the right balance between the uh, inputs that are coming from the uh, disruptive transformation of COVID-19 and what we have learned in centuries of, of history in hospital design. And the, mm, it's very interesting what you were saying before, but I think that since we are looking at healthcare architecture and healthcare is something that is very standardized across the world and is really global as, as COVID showed, but architecture is, is very grounded on the local base and on the manufacturing and artisanal uh, area, like in Italy especially. But I think these uh, two areas uh, cannot be like uh, uh, diversified just uh, to find uh, with tools and methodologies the way 
to fill the gap and, and provide global strategies, but at the same time that are um, scalable according to different realities, like the vaccination experience, uh, the vaccination center experience was pretty interesting on that because we tried to define a general layout that could then be uh, adaptable to many different realities, like uh, some uh, place in to the mountains in the Italian uh, Alps uh, is different than building a vaccination center in the core center of the city of Milan, for example. And I think we need to be very flexible, not just in the design technologies, but also in the process we, we have uh, into the design of healthcare facilities. And ha having talked here now about the uh, technology and what designs we do, and previously also about, uh, from Andrea's perspective, how we include the users and the sustainability and all of that. But we also have a group which is crucial because we have a, there, we, that's one of the resources we are short of, and that is the healthcare staff. That also brings us to the question, how do we include the healthcare staff in the planning? And how do we engage the healthcare system in also sort of developing itself with regards to design? Do you have any input on that grant or would you like to give a comment on that? If I use the, um, it's really so important, isn't it? I, I, I'm sure you've heard uh, the issues associated with our no nightingales, our, our massive, uh, facilities that we, we designed to uh, increase capacity to cope with uh, isolation and ICU, we, um, we were unable to staff them in the way that we wanted to staff them. Um, if I compare that with what we're doing with Moorfields, I think what was really interesting is that they started with um, techs, what they called them, that were, um, they were engaged in a process of education, which is a, a three to four week process of training them in how to operate these diagnostics equipment. Um, they've educated uh, with 30 people who are, are uh, who, who they kind of prioritized and um, recruited people that were in highly technologically um, savvy um, members of staff who weren't necessarily healthcare providers. So they retrained people who were uh, flight attendants, who were the, uh, you know, people who were, um, had good customer uh, experiences. And we took them through a process of how, how might we design with them and, and through a series of iterations with them. But it, it becomes really interesting, doesn't it, to reconsider how do we think about staffing and staffing categories and different functions in new ways, given that you know, the experience that we have now is completely different. Yeah. But, um, it's interesting. Yeah, so in the future, you can also choose. I would, I would like to be treated by a bartender, not by a nurse. <laughs> that would be going around. Anyway, going continue on the issue here of staff. Marcio, in, in Brazil, how do you interact with staff in healthcare design? You were commenting on the internationalization of designing. How does, how does staff come into that picture? Well, uh, the participant, uh, are, this is, uh, is becoming more common right now. Uh, to involve uh, staff in the design process, this is uh, this is something new. Um, you, we didn't hear about this like ten years ago. So I would say that maybe from uh, the last five years, this has become uh, more and more um, critical to involve all the the, the stakeholders. And one of the uh, the, the, the designs that. Uh, we've been uh, doing since the COVID, uh, we've been uh, discussing how to involve more and more the, the staff uh, in the design. I've, I've done this myself in some small designs that I did since last year, but I, I've seen that the, even the, the biggest, um, the, the projects that are being developed right now, this, has, this is a new feature for us to, to get all the staff involved and, in all the design phases, since uh, the, the early phases, uh, up to to uh, a mock-up and 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 detail uh, drawings. So, uh, I would say that most of uh, the, the biggest firms right now are, are are doing this as part of the design process, and they haven't been doing this uh, uh, for the past. So, the designs are 
more and more becoming a participatory uh, thing uh, involving all the, the, the agents and all the stakeholders. So um, I think we're going to see more and more interesting designs in the future because of that, because this, uh, this shift that's going on and we're starting to listening uh, to listen more and more to, to the users the future user of the but and then uh, you uh, i think you see an impact uh, of this uh, new brand let's say in the future so i hope that uh, more and more designs will, will uh, include that particular feature collaborative design yeah, that, that's a change in approach. Over to you, David, your thoughts on this. Well, I mean, in the U.S., we have a long tradition of engaging um, uh, uh, participants in healthcare delivery in the design process, building off of the work of William Pena and Problem Seeking, the book that some of you may be familiar with many, many years ago. Um, and, and so it's, it's an established process here. We don't have much of a competition system for how we design our public buildings. Um, and, and so uh, we engage a lot of healthcare was one of the industries that really adopted that approach towards, towards design uh, in the United States. And it's been practiced by some of the best firms and some of the best healthcare organizations in the country, uh, not all, but mostly it's, it's, it's common practice here. The challenge that I find is that, you know, when you're working with people in a given facility, they have deep knowledge of what, they, what they've what they experienced already. Uh, and they know what they know and they don't know what they don't know. And so I think the balance is to engage in a dialogue with the clients in which you're not just taking what they're asking you to provide them, but you're educating each other. Uh, they're educating the designers on the deep understanding of, of, of what goes on in a healthcare facility and, and, and design professionals then can share a broad, but not sure and shallow understanding of a, of a broader range of facilities. We've found, and again, it's hampered by COVID now, uh, but uh, virtual meetings have proven uh, positive, but taking clients uh, around to other best practice facilities uh, is, is an example of, of doing that, getting them outside of the frame of mind of what they know. Uh, also, of course, the ever building body of knowledge and evidence based design is, is helpful to build a common base of understanding, too. So, I mean, you know, that those are incredibly useful tools um, to to develop a, a mutual understanding and a common set of um, values uh, towards uh, driving a project. And so I think I think we have many more tools in our toolbox today with evidence-based design than we ever did before. And uh, so that's the, that's the trick. Okay, so thank you for that input, David. And uh, I couldn't get all that that's the trick at the end. It gives a, <laughs> it's what we need to, because as was also pointed out by Anna, we were having a chat here when we lost anything is that uh, given that we would like to engage staff, of course, in a sector where there's also is a shortage of staff and where they are very busy, um, we also have to find ways of doing this uh, effectively. So we have uh, both sort of efficiency challenges on facilities as well as, as, well as on the design process and then staff use also with regard to design. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. Um, so uh, I thought we should actually wrap it up. Um, so before they all thanks. And so is there any final comments from any of the presenters that you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? Andrea. Yes, I would like to um, underline this importance of um, involving the, the staff in the process. What I saw, and I do it with all my projects, that you see really a, a lead to few, fewer sick leave uh, of the staff, and you, you earn this back, yeah, and a much bigger identity with the building. It's really amazing, and, and I see it with all my students. They all ask for processes like this. It's a completely new generation. I don't know with you as other teachers uh, see, but but I'm really happy about this um, development, to, to be honest. And um, I, I never, I, I stopped planning any building without um, asking the staff and the users and everybody since almost 15 years, I guess. And it's uh, it's great that you see the great results and very happy people. <laughs> and that's where it's about, right? 
Yeah, and in Sweden, by the way, we've got the Co-Determination Act from 1974, where uh, staff, which is a requirement that staff or staff unions should have a say in, in design and reorganization of workplaces. So, so, so we have a long tradition. Uh, it doesn't mean it's perfect, but there's, there's a lot of build up on here. Um, any other final comments from any of the others, Andrea? Yeah, maybe starting from, uh, from uh, this and um, this tradition you have in, in Sweden. I, I was talking a few days ago with uh, Christiana Kaira about this, and um, it was funny to see that uh, um, in Sweden you have, you have this uh, long tradition, and I'm, I'm sure also in the US, like David and Anjali were saying, and in Italy we have a different uh, way, and uh, we tend to include a lot the uh, doctors in the preliminary phase of the project, but then it's very hard for us to get the nurses and the people who really work in the operation phase. And this makes sometimes uh, um, some, some design error or, or um, possibility to improve the design in the future because you have some strategic vision uh, but then you don't have chance to get to know the, the real uh, operations, how they work every day. So I think this is something we, we can uh, exchange and, and learn from each other. True, and I, I was saying Sweden, it's rather the opposite. We, we have a lot of nurses, but it's very hard to get to the doctors. <laughs> so, so, and it's also it's typical for nurses to move into also facilities planning uh, positions in, in the healthcare system in Sweden as well. So uh, there's a lot of nurses around, um, few doctors. Um, any other, we're getting close to three years. So any other thoughts that you do want like to share with us, Grant or Marcio or Anjali? Yeah, just on the same idea of in, engaging staff, uh, what I found has been really helpful is bringing in staff uh, when you're evaluating mock-ups or during pre-design or even when you're early stages of design because it gives them a very active way to be engaged. We're asking them to show their expertise and really enact scenarios that they are familiar with because if you show them a plan or even a 3D and say, how do you think this is going to work? they often may not be able to associate with that. But if you put them in an environment that's similar to what they're used to working in, they can tell you very quickly what's going to work and what's not going to work. And I think it's a great way to bring in multiple team members, doctors, nurses, uh, techs, cleaning folks, everybody can associate and they kind of can talk to each other because they all have a different way of engaging with the environment. So it helps to break down some of those hierarchies as well. Just a last thought. Yeah. So. Thank you. Actually, I'll build my, my closing on that, uh, bring in the different perspectives. And uh, actually, that is a key, key, one of the key puzzle, keys in the puzzle here, I think, for the future, that to engage broadly in those that actually are using the facilities. We all know that that is, in itself is easier to say than to do, but I think that's an objective that for sure should be up there on, on the design agenda. Um, so uh, I still think that's a positive note to end this uh, discussion and this panel on that uh, engage stakeholders, work broadly, engage in all the challenges and do it together um, is, is the way forward. Uh, I would like to thank the, all the panelists here for being here and sharing with us your thoughts on the topics today and giving us some insights in, in your situations. Uh, uh, to me, it's been very valuable to hear about all the different perspectives and actually getting a little bit more closer to your realities in your everyday work. Uh, I also thank all the audience. Uh, we haven't got many questions from you, but I'm, I'm sure you have been listening and have made a lot of notes. So if there are any follow-up questions that you have, send, us, send them to CVA in an email and, and we'll, we'll see if we can deal with them that way. So again, thank you all. And just to inform you, we will do a similar seminar uh, on what's happening in the, in, in the Nordic countries, in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, it's scheduled for, uh, well, January, February. We haven't set the date yet, so we have to fit that in. But we will send out an invitation to everybody who's been here today on that as well. Um, so again, thank you all for this. Uh, our work day here over in Sweden is beginning to end. And I think, Angela and Joseph, you are starting yours. So I hope this was a good start for you. This was certainly a good end for me. So I thank you all for being here. And uh, well, see you at the next stakeholder meeting on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Goron, for friend. inviting us. Bye. And it was a pleasure uh, listening to everybody and, and, and uh, meeting everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. It was really great. <laughs>